Thank you, Professor Lowe, for the introduction. My name is Ewan Johnson, and we'll be discussing antimicrobial peptides, what's next. So first of all, we'll take a look at um, what their basic structure is, then we'll move on to what their sort of functions are, and then where their future is in the field. So like lots of us, antimicrobial peptides are very small. So very small. So we're sort of like something like... And then we have the small antimicrobial peptides. They usually consist of 10 to 50 amino acids. They're made up of anionic or cationic charges. They usually consist of mainly hydrophobic residues um, and have a mainly overall, over, an amph mainly overall amphipathic nature. Uh, they're involved in their innate immune response, meaning that they react in a non-specific way to pathogens. Um, they're ubiquitous in nature, meaning they're found everywhere, so all over the planet. And from they are found from the smallest prokaryotes to the most mighty uh, eukaryotes, like the human. Um, and then they have a wide range of targets. Due to their sort of uh, ability to induce pores in the membrane, they can attack almost anything. So let's move on to the four types of antimicrobial peptides. First of all, we have the anionic peptides. These characteristically contain large amounts of uh, aspartic or glutamic acids. Um, an example is germicidin, which is found in the mucous membranes of the skin, or in, in fact in the mouth, and it's used as just a general antibacterial. Number two is the linear cationic alpha helical peptides. Uh, these uh, characters here lack cysteine residues. An example is the sacropins, which are found in uh, lots of insects, like the fly here. And uh, they usually use it in the gut and uh, in the mouth as a general antibacterial. Number three, we have the Pacific amino acid enriched cationic peptides. And as the name suggests, they are enriched with certain amino acids like proline, arginine, glycine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. Uh, the, an example of these is indolocidin, which is currently used in conjunction with antibiotics to treat uh, persistent staphylococcus infections. So with that treatment, you can allow the car to carry on moving and say interesting things like, yeah, I if a car ever said that, then what I'd say, probably wow. <laughs> um, moving on to the final one, we have the cysteine-containing antimicrobial peptides. Uh, as the name suggests, they contain uh, cysteine residues, usually in the form of disulfide bonds between one to three of them. Um, and uh, an example of these is the tachyoplesions, which uh, has antiviral properties, which allows to keep this horseshoe crab alive, which I'm not sure is a really great thing. <laughs> that's not high, by the way. I think that's like a, an infection or something. I don't know. <laughs> so obviously, the antimicrobial, antimicrobial peptides aren't really working. So I'm not sure how many of you guys recognize this photo. This is from a movie back in the day called Osmosis Jones. It's one of the main reasons why I got into biochemistry. So I know it's a bit sad, but that's why we do this. <laughs> So, I don't know if you guys remember, these are the white blood cells, but for now we'll say that this man here, the chief, is an antimicrobial peptide. So we're talking about the uses now. So the general use of an antimicrobial peptide in the body is the natural defense against pathogens. Then we have our friend over here, Drix, who is, uh, let's say, for instance, he's an antibiotic. Him and the main character, Osmosis Jones, come into the body and work together to help defend against um, pathogens. So they work together from outside and come in. So, due to the chemotactic nature of antimicrobial peptides, they have the ability to induce um, an enhanced immune response. Uh, so, this allows them to have a wide range of actions. So, they have antibacterial properties against both gram negative and gram positive bacteria. They have um, antiparasitic activity against things like malaria, tryptansomas, and leishmanias. Uh, they are often found in secondary hosts like the fly and the mosquito. I don't know how many of you guys uh, know the mosquito. If you don't, uh, they're everywhere, especially if you live near rooms like where I live. Um, moving on to the other properties, they have antifungal properties against things like Cryptococcus, Aspergillus, and Candida. If any of you guys do running, if you run too much and you don't clean your shoes or clean your feet, you often end up with a terrible smell, and that's where we can probably introduce some antimicrobial peptide creams to kind of eradicate that smell. So lastly, it's been found that uh, antimicrobial peptides have action against a lot of uh, viruses like influenza, HIV, and the herpes virus, even though this has only been proved in vitro models, it, uh, it has a wide range of future possibilities. Um, so they've also, so more excitingly, they've been found that they have anti-cancer properties. Due to the disproportionate amount of negative charges on the cell surface, they can be used to um, eradicate, so, due to, so they, uh, cancer cells have become a target of antimicrobial peptides. So antibiotics have sort of become the Batman of our time. They were once loved as these mighty destroyers and they now become sort of a negative thing where they've, so they've been tasked for removal. So antimicrobial peptides have been suggested as a viable alternative. 
They still do build up a sort of resistance to it. Pathogens do still build up a resistance, but it's far slower than traditional antibiotics. So in conclusions, they're found everywhere, they're involved in the innate immune response, they can target a wide range of pathogens, and they have future possibilities of treatments of viruses, persistent bacterial infections, and possibly cancers. Thank you.